early on when I was a Christian, I, I started reading the Bible and and as I was doing that, I was reading through the, the New Testament and reading through the Gospels and all these things are kind of jumping to life. And I come to this book called Philemon. It just didn't make any sense to me. And I, I go to my pastor friend who's my mentor. I say, hey, look, I've got to this book Philemon. I've read through it and nothing, I'm getting nothing out of it. And he said, in his wisdom, he said, well, you need to read it again. I said, okay. And he said, and if that doesn't work, you need to read it again. You need to read it until something jumps out at you. And so I took his advice and I did that. And a couple more times through, some verses really started jumping out and God really started speaking to me on that. Perhaps the reason he was separated for you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, Welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. And then he goes on to say, he said, I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Then later in the, in, in the chapter, he says, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. The Lord was just impressing on me that I had held um, my dad in, in a bondage and as a slave to my unforgiveness. And uh, so that week I called him up and this was, it was so hard to do. Um, I didn't want to do it. Everything in me was screaming, no, no, no. But I knew the Lord had spoke to my heart and I called him up and I just said, I forgive you. I forgive you for all the things. I forgive you for the abandonment. I, I forgive you for the hurt. I forgive you for the shame. I forgive you for all these things. And um, that was a powerful moment. And um, But from there, it kind of became a process. You know, over the next 10 years, it seemed like we would take a step or two forward and then we'd take a step or two back. You know, I'd get cards for Christmas and, um, you know, we were having kids throughout all these years. But it's about a 10 step process just God moving us forward and it, it didn't seem like we were getting anywhere honestly it, it seemed like we were stagnant um, but God was at work behind the scenes and uh, he knew he had some serious heart work to do on me because my heart was super calloused and super hardened towards my dad and uh, he was doing that work when I couldn't see it. It's, it's really hard putting words but it was absolutely shocking because I, I, I didn't see it coming. I always felt it was me not, not him. Growing up, you know, without your biological dad around, there's something within every kid that wants their parents. They want their parents' approval. Um, they want their parents just to say, you know, I believe in you, I'm for you, I'm behind you, all those things. And, um, and, and, and my mom was good at those things. Um, she was super good at those things. Um, but there's just something, especially in a man's soul, that wants his dad's approval. Not having that, it's almost like I was wearing a weighted blanket, just a cloak that I was carrying with me everywhere. And it led to bitterness and it led to a hardness that um, honestly, I, I, I really couldn't see it in the moments, you know. I, I ended up getting caught up in drugs and alcohol and um, just trying to mask those things that I knew were there um, intellectually, but I couldn't see it at a heart level. After I became a Christian, I knew God was stirring in my heart about those things. But you know, when God's calling you to do something hard or he's pushing on something that's tender, kind of, kind of our first reaction is to stiff arm that and say, we're not going there. And, uh, and that's what I was doing. And uh, I believe he knew that it was gonna take something like that, something like the scripture jumping alive. It's right there, this is what I'm calling you to do. Um, and it wasn't easy. Like I said, it wasn't easy. Um, but I knew that if I moved towards that, there'd be a blessing to attach to it. And I didn't know what it looked like, you know, on my end, you know, you have all these fears. If I come out of my comfort zone, um, if, I, if I try to release him from that, what is that gonna look like? Am I gonna be rejected again? Like that's, that's kind of what's playing in your mind. And um, for me, going out on that limb, it was, it was something that I couldn't fight anymore. Well, when I made that call, I mean, honestly, I, I was working out of fear. I mean, that, that's what was going on internally was fear. 
And, uh, you know, I feel like God meets us in those moments and He gives us His grace to overcome those things. And I remember even picking up the phone and my hand was shaking. And, um, I know my voice was probably cracking and I was walking on shaky ground is really what I was doing. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know what that would look like. I didn't know what He would say. I just knew what I was called to do. And I knew that if I didn't do that, that God was gonna keep pressing that button until I did something about it. He was out of my life at an early age, so um, I think, you know, maybe around the age of one, he, he was already gone, and we had some contact here and there, um, maybe in, until I was about 10. Um, but it was pretty limited, and um, through that time, I, I kept in contact with my grandma. My grandma Loretta is the best of the best, and she was very intentional, uh, intentional about staying in contact with me. I, forever, I called my dad Dan, like when he was out of the picture early, I resorted to call him Dan. I figured if he doesn't want to be my dad, I don't want to call him dad. And uh, my grandma would always call him, he would, she would always refer to him as my dad and that would drive me absolutely crazy. And so she would give me updates on him and I, I knew that he had walked through some, some struggles. I knew that he had fallen prey to alcoholism and, and made some bad choices. Um, I also knew that he had remarried twice um, over the years and that he had three kids of his own. And, and as you can imagine, that added to kind of um, the unworthiness. You know, he's, he's got a new family. You know, he's there with them. What's wrong with me? She kept me up to speed, and, and she deserves all the credit for that. I, I knew what I had done, and I carried a tremendous amount of guilt about it. Uh, from, the, from the time his mother and I split up, clear to the time that he called me and said, hey, Dad, I want to let you know I forgive you. Uh, and I, and I believe that that guilt probably led me down some of the trails that I took in my life. Every time I'd think about him, I would think myself as an awful person. Uh, and I was an awful dad, there's no, no way of changing that. Uh, but I, I beat myself up pretty hard. And then, then I would forget. Uh, and drugs and alcohol helps a person's memory fade. Uh, and so there was times that I might go months at a time and not even think about him. And then when I would think about him, I just, it was all negative towards me. Because he was a great child. All, all children are wonderful. I, children are my favorite people. And that's the deal when he called me and, and said, hey dad, I want you to know, I, I forgive you for all, everything. I didn't feel like he had anything to forgive me. <laughs> you know? uh, he, he had done no wrong. And usually if you're gonna say, you know, yeah, you, have to, you have to feel like you did something wrong. Well, he hadn't. Uh, so, yeah, as I look back on it, I think that's what, every, as I think about him, I think about how cute he was and the little fun things we did. And then I think, but, but you haven't done anything for him. You haven't stayed in touch with him. And I beat myself up about it quite a bit. Uh, my mom, uh, Loretta, was, uh, she oh, I saw your son, and, he, and she showed me pictures. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that was actually about the only pictures I saw uh, there was a time that he had pretty good contact with my dad and I saw some pictures and he was like three, four, five years old and then from there till, uh, till recently uh, the only thing I saw out of him came through my mother. Uh, I knew he liked motorcycles and uh, I knew that he had, his last name had changed. And that's about all I knew. I mean, it really, from the time he was 10 years old on, I didn't know very much about him. Well, he, and actually, we talked on the phone one time, uh, and we visited about it, and he doesn't really remember it, but he was like 16 years old. Uh, and he called me Dan then. And it just made my gut hurt, you know. <laughs> I didn't want to be Dan, uh, but I didn't deserve to be Daddy. Uh, and I didn't, I don't think I corrected him in any way at that time, but yeah, that's, you know, that's, pretty far step from being dad to go to first first name basis. It feels really good. He calls me dad a lot now. And every time he does, it gives me a good warm fuzzy feeling. My oldest daughter is 25 now, but when she was eight, uh, we had a birthday party and trampoline and pools and so forth. And I was slipping out to the trunk, getting drunk and stoned while the kids were playing. Not proud of it, but that's just the way it was. And somehow in my drunkenness, uh, God spoke to me. And uh, the next day I went and got help. I was, I was an everyday drunk. 
and every day uh, smoked a lot of pot. And I did recreational drugs on the side from time to time, the cocaines and the LSDs and so forth. I would, I would try anything, but what really had me uh, was booze. And I got to where I drank so much booze, I was, I was dying. Not, and I wasn't being a dad to my uh, three kids. Fortunately, none of them remember ever seeing me drunk. Uh, God helped me before that point came. Uh, but she was, a, it was her eighth birthday party that actually, it was like God literally spoke to me. Said, you need to quit drinking, you need to get help. And so I went to a uh, poor county mental health is what it's called told the counselor how much I was drinking and how much I was smoking and that, that's where my recovery started. The Lord has blessed me to be, I, I'm in some wonderful, wonderful ministries at our church and outside the church. Went up to, count, uh, to the jail for a while, taking recovery up there. Um, and I started reading the Bible. And then I went from AA to celebrate recovery. So through my late teens, early 20s, um, I would use I would use drugs and um, I became a heavy drinker you know I became a bartender and through that you know I'm surrounded by alcohol I'm slinging drinks to everybody else and, and I'm pounding them myself and um, it got to the point I was I was working a night shift I'd, I'd given up the drugs and this is before I became a Christian I'd given up a drug the drugs because I had met a wonderful woman who I'm married to now and um, I knew that wasn't going to fly um, but I but Drinking was socially acceptable, you know, at least in my mind, and I don't have any qualms with other people having to drink either, but um, it came to a point where I was just becoming so deceptive about it. I was working the night shift at work, and on my way home, I'd grab a small bottle of vodka and I'd slam as much as I could on the way home, and I would put whatever was remaining under my seat, and I'd walk in, into my house and hope my wife didn't smell it on me, you know, and. Just the guilt and the shame from that was just, it was becoming overwhelming. And I remember it vividly, you know, Becca was still working, um, cutting hair at the time. And it was, it was, it was a Monday morning and she was at, headed off to work. And at this time we just had one child, my little daughter, London, and she was just under two. And uh, I had drank a lot the night before. And uh, I, I rolled out of bed just feeling like a train wreck in every sense of the word, just, just feeling terrible, you know. I'm, I'm trying to serve her breakfast. I've got this sweet little innocent girl just staring at me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge. And uh, God met me in that moment and he said, this isn't it. Like, you can't keep doing this. And I'm, I'm looking at her and I'm trying to serve her breakfast and um, all of a sudden I just have this urge. I, I go grab the remaining bottle of, of uh, bourbon that I had and I just start dumping it down the sink. And I'm looking at her and, you know, she has no idea what's going on. And I'm having like this moment, you know. <laughs> I'm dumping it down the sink and I'm like, Daddy's not gonna drink anymore. Daddy's not gonna drink anymore. I've got tears coming out, <laughs> streaming down my face, you know. And, you know, she, she doesn't understand what's going on. And, and that was it. Um, I dumped it down the drain and I, I never drank again. And uh, kind of a bizarre, twist of that story is I, I stayed behind the bar um, you know the, the logical choice says wow you quit drinking you got to get behind, out from behind that bar um, but honestly as I as I sought the Lord on it I felt like he was impressing on me like you have built all these relationships over the years and I've put you there there for this moment and uh, they started calling me the Bible reading bartender because you know all my regulars would come in and I'd be reading my scriptures and they'd say what are you reading or what are you learning about and um, you know, I'd get to share with them some of those things, and um, God kept me there for that season. And it, it's it's wild to talk about; like it just seems so bizarre. Um, but God showed me, like a lot of people that are on the other side of that bar, they don't have anybody else, and they've shared things with you that they've shared with nobody else. And if you leave now, your work there is done. And uh, He showed me that He wasn't finished with me there, and He used me for that season. I knew enough about my dad and, and about some of the mistakes that he had made to know that I was going down the same trail. And for all those years, I hated him for that. And what started, be, started happening to me is that I started hating myself for it because I was becoming exactly um, 
the man that I that I thought that I hated. Um, I was making the same mistakes. In one in one way, it would seem like you'd give it make me give more grace to him, but it, it really it just turned inward on myself because everything I didn't want to be, I, I saw myself turning into, and um, it wasn't a good place to be. Once I started reading the Bible, one of the very first verses I passages I memorized was Proverbs 3 verse 5 and 6 and it says trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path and uh, that's something that I held fast to pretty early on um, learning to trust him when things don't make sense learning to trust him when he's pointing you in a direction that you say I don't want to go I'm learning to trust that on the other side of your comfort zone is going to be blessing and, um, and that's a hard place. I mean, I'm not saying that's easy. That is, that is not an easy thing. Um, but once I started leaning into that concept, um, that's where fruition started coming. And that's, that's really, honestly, for me, at least my side of the story, that's, that's where my side of the story comes about. I mean, learning to trust him when you can't see the end result learning to trust Him when it seems like uncertainty, or learning to trust Him when it seems like there's going to be rejection on the other end, um, but saying, God, if you say it, I'm going to do it. See, Dad gave me a Bible it was 35 years ago, yeah. and he marked one scripture in it, yeah. and it was that proverb. Yeah. He, he underlined and highlighted, I don't know if we've talked about that or not. Wow. Uh, yeah, the, and matter of fact, my Bible I carry now, Yeah. At that scripture, it's got a note. Dad gave me a Bible, and that's the only scripture that he marked in it. Proverbs three yeah. five through six. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, once once we made contact uh, over the phone, then and, and Nathan Nathan said it was moving real slow, and it was. It was painfully slow, but I felt like that God was at work on both of us. Yeah. Uh, they probably, probably immediately made me a better dad to my kids that I was raised and I was already trying, trying pretty hard. Uh, but you know, there's something powerful about God's Word. I talked to all kinds of people. There's a lot of people tried to help me over the years and it just did not work. When you get into God's Word, if you're actually in it to try to find out how, what God want me to do, it becomes crystal clear. A lot of times I read the Bible and just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Just like just words. Yeah. But if I'll hang in there, uh, sure enough, there's always a message for me. And so Nate's got all of my grandkids, yeah. and those those children are my bloodline. Uh, I don't I don't mind at all that they don't have my name. For a while, that really just drove me crazy. But I've, I've come to peace with that. I understand it history and there ain't no going back and changing it uh, but I, I love the kids and uh, thankfully they seem to love me they, yeah. they, they certainly they certainly like my jerky yeah <laughs> you've won them over <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I literally thought it was a bridge that I had burned so hard that there was no possibility I, I had no hope for it no, no aspirations for it they come pretty far from left field from, from where I was sitting. The very first time when he came to the house, uh, right out the bat, I stuck my hand out and he gives me, he sticks his arms out, you know. And we, we've tried not to have any secrets. And I think that's helped us along. Uh, we're finding we have characteristics that are the same. <laughs> all the way from the drinking characteristics to personality defects. So, you know, we, we tend to have some of them. Hey, but we grow uh, plants. That's right. Yeah, we grow plants. And sometimes it surprises both of us how much we have in common. And as I'm getting to know the grandkids, you know, yeah. every one of their personalities are, are so different. But I can see a little bit of Nate in this one, a little bit of Nate in that one. The major shift was when I went to my grandma Loretta's 80th birthday party. I knew there were going to be so many of my relatives from my dad's side that I hadn't seen in years. And I also knew that him and his family were going to be there. And, uh, but we, we thought it was important to be there for my grandma's sake. And uh, we get there and a just super warm welcome. Everybody's excited to see us. They're excited to see the kids, you know. They've seen them on Facebook and all these things. But you know, now we're here and it's real. And uh, I just remember 
spending some time talking to my dad and uh, it just it flowed pretty natural honestly we laughed a lot we fished a lot we ate a lot of good food uh, but most of all in those moments what we did and, and really what God did was was he healed our hearts and he mended our relationship shift together and, um, you know through that just to see where we are now you know 30 plus years, I mean, around a 30 year period, we didn't really have any relationship at all. 30 years is a long time, three decades is a long time. Um, and those 10 years after I forgave him where we were moving forward and barely moving and inching forward and all that, and it didn't seem like we were going anywhere, that was a long time. Um, but now it's been a year since I've been at his place. And through that time, you know, we've remained a constant, we've kept a constant connection. Um, through messaging, through phone calls, um, and that's why he's down here now, as he wanted to come and see the kids and see my boys play baseball. And sometimes God shows up, and sometimes He really shows off. And uh, <laughs> He showed off with this one. I feel like restoration is is so big and so encompassing, and I feel like that that's what the gospel is all about. It's all about restoration. It's all about reconciliation. And. God has had his hand in the middle of this for years. Um, I feel like there are going to be people that say, you know, Nate, that is fantastic, but I don't know God like that. I just, I, I want, I think it's so important for people to know that um, God values you just as much. There's nothing special about us. As a matter of fact, our lives have been riddled with mistakes, with heartbreak, uh, with failures, um, but we serve the God that redeems. And, um, you know, God thought that you and I and everyone on this planet was important enough to send his son Jesus. And Jesus came here to die on the cross to pay for our sins that we could never pay for. And you know, every drop of blood he shed on that cross was him saying, you're worth it. And every, <laughs> every nail he took was him saying, you're worth it. And every ounce of excruciating pain that he endured was him saying, you're absolutely worth it. And when he was buried and raised three days later, that was an explanation point on him saying, you are absolutely worth it. And so for those of you that may be watching this and, and you say, that God, I don't know that God. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. I want to read you a passage of scripture and I hope it makes it clear. In Romans chapter 10, it says, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's a twofold promise. Um, what he's referring to here is that he wants to save you from your sin. He wants to save you from yourself. He wants to redeem you. He wants to restore you. And, and he wants to give you a relationship with him that means that you'll be in heaven for eternity with him. Um, but the twofold, twofold side of that is that he wants to do something powerful in, in and through your life while you're here. And uh, that's the only explanation for our story. I mean, that he wanted to do something powerful in and through two broken human beings um, that couldn't have been done on our own. And, um, you know, I think that there might be some on the flip side that say, you know, Nate, I get that. I'm a Christian, but I, I don't, I've never seen God move like that in my life. And I, I totally get that. There are times in our life where we're like, God, where are you at? What are you doing? What are you up to? I can't see you. I can't sense you. What, what are you doing behind the scenes? And uh, to that, I would say there, there's a pastor that I've listened to over the years. And growing up, he tells this story. He said, growing up, my dad always said this. He said, if God tells you to put your head through a brick, brick wall, you just start running with your head down and trust God to make a hole. And uh, that's what I want to encourage you with. Um, God's going to call you to do some things that are uncomfortable. It's not because um, it's not because He wants to harm you. It's not because He doesn't have your best interests in mind. Actually, it's the flip side that He wants to do something so great in you that you could never do on your own, and He wants to push you out of your comfort zone to do those things, to do that hard work, and to do that to do that work in your life that wouldn't be accomplished otherwise. So I just want to say this: like, what is that thing? What is that brick wall? that God's calling you to. And a lot of you that are listening to this, you probably know what that is. You've probably, like me, been stiff-arming it for a lot of years. But I just want to encourage you through this that our story's not special. 
and special because God's in the middle of it. But if God's calling you to run with your head down towards a brick wall, I, I promise if you start running, he's gonna make a hole. And eventually, like us, you're gonna be able to look back and see just how big that hole is and, and see what he did and it's gonna make sense. And you're gonna be able to connect the dots and you're gonna say, only you, God, like only you could do that. And that's the God we serve. God can restore because he's the creator. We can't really fix things. We can take something we've broken and glue it back together and it looks terrible. But God can actually take and remake. Uh, and that's kind of what he's done with us is he's, he's given us a whole new, whole new shot at this thing. He's, he's remade our relationship. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened if uh, God's word hadn't been involved.